My name is Sonia Sadakar, and today I'll be presenting our work on estimating emissions from competing onboard autonomous vehicles. This work is done in collaboration with my advisors, Professor Vivian Z and Professor Sertesh Karkin. So we interact with computing in a variety of ways in our daily life. So a day in the life of a grad student might involve us listening to a podcast at breakfast. By the time we get to work, we might do some coding, we might do some Zoom meetings. And then finally, when we get home, we might unwind by streaming our favorite TV show. And while it may not feel like it when we're doing these computing activities, all of these computing activities are powered by electricity. And that's generated by a mix of fossil fuels and renewable energy resources, and ultimately results in emissions being generated. And one reason we might not think about the direct implication from doing computing to emissions is that a lot of this is abstracted away in the cloud or data centers where a lot of that computing takes place. But in fact, all these data centers also consume a lot of electricity and produce a lot of emissions. So much so that there's been a lot of concern about the emissions from data centers. In 2018, Data centers alone contribute 0.3% of global emissions. To put that in perspective, that's more than all the emissions of the country of Argentina, which itself is a 19th largest emitter by country. And another baseline you might be uh, thinking about is how much is 1% of global emissions equal? Well, that's equivalent to all the emissions of Canada, which is the seventh largest emitter by country, and is only a little bit less than the entire aviation industry. So there's clear cause for concern for data centers already becoming a big problem. And there's worry that with workloads like uh, machine learning and deep neural networks or DNNs, that this kind of workload is supposed to grow and these kind of emissions may only grow in the future. In a parallel thread, we also have a lot of investment from industry and uh, academia in realizing a fully autonomous vehicle. And the task of getting a fully autonomous vehicle is quite difficult so that it requires a lot of computing, causing some people to even call them supercomputers on wheels. And are you curious of whether the workloads across all data centers would be comparable to that found on a global fleet of EVs? And one way of thinking about why they could potentially be comparable is thinking about just the number of inferences here, DNNs, per day. So for example, across all of Facebook's data centers, there were trillions of inferences per day uh, as order of magnitude. Now, if you consider an autonomous vehicle that has 10 DNNs, it runs it at 60 hertz, and it runs this on each image from 10 camera inputs. Uh, for one AV, you would get 21.6 million inferences per hour driven. And considering that we have 1.2 billion cars on the road today, if a majority of those cars were autonomous, so let's say a billion, that would be 21.6 quadrillion inferences per hour driven. So what that means for us is if the day in the life of a grad student to commute to work, I take an autonomous vehicle and I compete back in an autonomous vehicle as well, the computer onboard of those AVs consume electricity and that electricity is generated by some mix of fossil fuel and renewable energy resources and hence produces emissions. So our research question was, would the carbon emissions from a global fleet of AVs, would that be significant? And could it be comparable to that of all data centers today? And if so, what can we do about it to make sure this doesn't become a significant problem in the future? So there's been increased attention paid to emissions from computing. Uh, one research thrust has focused on emissions coming from the fact that these computational workloads can be quite intensive. Uh, this is looking at data centers at large, since a lot of computation is done at data centers, as well as a specific domain of training deep neural networks for DNNs, where these models are getting larger and larger and to train them can actually cost a lot of emissions. There's also been a research thrust looking at the emission and emissions and carbon footprint of a mobile phone, where it really exemplifies an example of scaling causing emissions, where one phone alone probably isn't a significant amount of emissions, but when you multiply it across the billions of phones that are in the world today, can become significant enough for us to want to design for that. And then finally, we also have the research thrust of just looking at emissions from emerging applications. One application people have had a discussion back and forth on is whether or not Bitcoin mining will cause significant emissions since it's another computer intensive task. And the work we will present here, which is emissions from AVs, 
really cuts across all three of these themes where there are going to be significant computational workloads because often they will be DNN based, especially for the perception stack. There's going to be the issue of scaling where one autonomous vehicle alone may not be significant, but when you look at a global fleet of autonomous vehicles, those emissions can certainly add up. And it's also an emerging application where we don't have a fully autonomous vehicle yet, and we certainly do not have a global fleet of autonomous vehicles yet, but this is something that has so much investment in that it's a possible future scenario that we do end up in that scenario. And it's something that we want to make sure we design ahead of it becoming a problem so that we can uh, just contribute more to the solution than the problem itself. So when we talk about emissions from computing, we often want to think about how much does the vehicle take to move as well, or the actuation energy. So in this figure, I've plotted on the top a variety of robotic platforms by increasing energy they take to move one meter. And on the bottom, I've arranged a variety of embedded computing platforms by the energy they take to compute one second. And a lot of my work focuses usually on the left side of this figure, where we're looking at very energy efficient robots, so that the energy they take to move is on a very similar magnitude as these embedded computers take to compute. And if you compare uh, on this uh, figure a car, so here I put a Tesla Model 3, to these embedded computers, you could say that it's on a completely different magnitude, the energy to move versus the energy these embedded computers take to compute. But if instead of plotting embedded computers on the bottom, I plot some of the AV hardware that's in uh, production or proposed for production, we see that actually a very similar story for AVs here again, where the energy the cars takes to move is much higher than those energy efficient robots, but the uh, energy the computers takes to make that car fully autonomous and keep it safe and keep us safe has also increased. So again, we're in a scenario where the energy we spend on computing could be on a very similar magnitude as energy we spend on actuation. So throughout this talk so far, I've been saying fully autonomous. And by that, I really mean level five autonomy. The Society of Engineers have come up with this system of levels to describe different levels of automation, ranging from level one, which is things like ADAS and cruise control, all the way to level five, which would be full autonomy. Basically, you don't need a backup driver in any situation, and it can uh, travel in any environment. Without, uh, without assistance and basically as good as a human driver. So we're definitely not at level five yet, but there's been a lot of attention focused and investment focused on getting us there. So when we talk about a future global fleet of AVs, we're really discussing a potential level five global fleet of AVs. So when we wanna characterize a footprint of autonomy onward, this, um, onward an AV, Emissions can come from two different types of sources. One is embodied emissions, and these are emissions that can be paid once and usually at manufacturing time. There's also operational emissions, and these are emissions that come from the daily use of the device. So to get the full footprint of autonomy onboard AVs, we want to be concerned about the embodied emissions from computers, sensors, batteries, as well as the operational emissions from the computers and sensors. For the scope of this analysis, we look at just the operational carbon emissions from the computers. So you can consider the analysis we present as a lower bound since there's all these other sources of emissions we cannot account for. And we leave that as a really exciting avenue for future work to be able to characterize the complete footprint of autonomy onboard these agents. All right, so how do we actually calculate the operational emissions from computing onboard agents? It comes down to this pretty simple equation where we want to calculate G, which is a CO2 equivalent tons per year. That's a function of the number of AVs N, Q, which is the average time driven per AV, I, which is the carbon intensity of the power source that's generating the electricity that's running the computers on board these AVs, and P, which is the computer power uh, on, on board the AV, along with the constant rate of conversion. So if we know each of these variables exactly, we can go ahead and plug it into the equation and get an exact uh, calculation for the emissions. For example, let's assume that I, which is the carbon intensity, is equal to the 2020 global average carbon intensity per grid, and that Q, which is the average time driven, is equal to one hour per AV. In this figure, as you go left to right, we're sweeping across the value of P, which is the computer power, 
And on the y-axis, we're plotting G, which is the emissions per year. In the various solid colored lines, I've plotted different values of N, which is the number of ages. So if you know exact values of each of these variables, you can go ahead and place yourself exactly on this plot. For example, given that we were looking at a scenario where there's 1 billion ABs, so we're looking at the orange line, and that we're looking at a computer power of about 840 watts, that would place us at where that white marker is. And we could say that in this scenario, uh, emissions from computing onboard ABs would get us to the same amount of emissions as all data centers today. The problem with this kind of analysis is that it only gives us a point estimate, and we don't know with certainty the values of each of these variables. And there's a lot of uncertainty on each of these variables because we're talking about an emerging application that's not here yet fully. For example, for the number of vehicles, uh, some of the uncertainty comes from when will level five autonomy be solved, as well as when it is solved, how quickly will it be adopted by the public? Uncertainty also comes in the driving time of ABs, with some research showing that driving time will actually increase because now you can multitask while you're in the AV, so you can live farther from work and take that Zoom meeting while you're on your own. <coughs> Whereas other research shows that driving time might actually decrease because of optimized grabbing, for example. There's also uncertainty on the carbon intensity, mainly to do with how quickly the world is going to decarbonize over the next few decades. And there's uncertainty on what that computer power is going to be for a level five autonomous vehicle. Some of the sources of that uncertainty comes from the fact that even current AV stacks often are proprietary in nature, and most AV companies are not releasing the computer power of their current AV stacks, as well as the fact that since we're looking um, at level five autonomy that's not yet achieved, there's questions on what that solution is going to look like um, with uncertainty on, for example, what are the right number of sensors to use in that solution, as well as since we're looking at a Emerging future application, there's uncertainty on what the energy efficiency of the hardware is going to be when we're looking at a particular year, for example. And that places us as uncertainty on this x axis of the figure. So instead of giving a specific scenario and giving a point estimate, we'd ideally like to actually incorporate the uncertainties in each of these variables and then have a way that explicitly takes into account those uncertainties and produces distributions of likely scenarios and therefore likely emissions. Which, from which we can make conclusions probabilistically on where we think we're heading. And that's exactly what we propose. We probabilistically model each variable as a distribution to directly incorporate the uncertainty in each variable and then produce distributions of emissions. We also project future scenarios from 2025 to 2050, and we allow uh, in our open source framework to change all the uh, parameters as far as future trends go in the adoption rates, the annual changes in workload size, hardware energy efficiency, and carbon intensity. And this entire uh, framework will be made open source so that we can modify it as new information comes in, and also so that industry can use it with their internal proprietary numbers and then at least release that final emissions footprint. So for each of these variables, we model uh, probabilistically uh, both through a literature survey as well as some metric experiments. And for sake of time, I'll just discuss how we model computer power. So we model the workload on an AV as a DNN-based workload. And that's because it's going to likely be a majority of the perception stack and a significant amount of the compute uh, for the workload. Uh, to model that workload, we select a multitask DNN, where we have a shared encoder and separate decoders, one for each task the AV has to solve. A task for an AV could be, for example, a pedestrian detector or a classifier on whether or not a car door that's parked, um, whether that door is open or not. Now, there's uncertainty on what that number of tasks is going to be when we're looking at a level five autonomous vehicle. So we model that variable of uh, the number of tasks as a Poisson random variable, where we can also change the mean of that distribution. And we look at uh, between 10, 50, and 100 tasks for that mean. And then we actually measure the power and latency of this network with different numbers of tasks on a uh, measured hardware platform. We model that we want to run this full multitask network C times on the images from C different cameras. And again, C is an unknown variable where we don't know the exact number of cameras a level five autonomous vehicle is going to need. So we model that as well with a Poisson random variable. And again, can sweep across different means for that. <coughs> 
we want to be able to achieve this uh, workload at a target throughput f. And since that target throughput is again part of that level of execution, we model that as well as a, as a Poisson random variable here with the means uh, ranging between 30 hertz and 60 hertz. And finally, even though we measure on one hardware, we really want to be talking about the hardware efficiency on a piece of hardware that could actually go in one of these APs. So to do that, we scale by the ratio of tops per watt on the measured hardware versus the target hardware. Uh, to be noted, tops per watt is not a holistic measure of energy efficiency for hardware, but it's often the only metric we have when it's uh, a hardware that's just announced and not even in production, or just a hard to access hard piece of hardware. So we use it as a first order approximation. We can also model future trends in computer power. Um, so looking first at hardware energy efficiency, we expect the trend to increase over time, and it does. Uh, so what we did here is that we did a literature survey of announced AV hardware platforms, and we plot in this figure the tops per watt versus the production date, and we run a linear regression, and we can find that it's doubling every 2.8 years on average right now. We can also model the size of the workload growing. Um, the current trend in DNNs is to keep growing and getting better accuracy as a result. And we can do that by scaling that uh, workload size by a factor of eight, for the latency we think it's going to take if we scale it to a larger workload. And the high level takeaway is that the framework is capable of modeling these changes over time um, that we would want to see when we're modeling the uh, future trends. All right, so now I will discuss some of the uh, results that we have. And the baselines I'll usually compare to is that of emissions from all data centers today as well as 1% of total emissions. And again, just to remind you that these are very significant amount of emissions where we certainly don't want as an industry to be, you know, contributing more than the entire country's worth of emissions. In this figure, what we've done is we've set the emissions to a certain, we've constrained it to equal one of the baselines. So here we're constra uh, constrained G, which is the emissions, to equal that of all data center emissions today. And then we asked the question, if emissions from computing onboard AVs is constrained to equal that of data centers, what is the uh, computer power in the 1 million scenarios that we uh, simulated? And we plot that empirical probability density function in this figure, and on the x-axis is computer power. And in the different colors, we've uh, shown different rates of adoption of AVs. So for example, in the purple, would be a case where 95% of AVs today, or, or of vehicles today, would be autonomous. We can repeat this analysis where we constrain the emissions to different targets. So instead of constraining emissions to be that of data centers, we can constrain it to a larger amount, which is 1% of total emissions, and repeat the same analysis and see the distribution of what the computer power has to be if we want emissions to stay constrained. We hope that this kind of uh, experiment can give us actionable insights, such as if you look at the purple distribution, so in the case where 95% of vehicles today are autonomous, uh, we can say that in 90% of the scenarios, uh, computer power had to stay under 1.2 kilowatts for emissions to stay under that of all data centers today. And this kind of uh, insight is hopefully helpful for industry to have targets to aim for as we try to design ahead of the problem and before waiting for it to become a big emissions problem. We also show some results uh, regarding the future trends scenarios. So in this figure, as you go left to right, we're going from 2025 to 2050. On the y-axis is emissions, which is the variable G in our equation. Uh, here, we're assuming a moderate adoption scenario. So we're saying going from 0% of the market share in 2025, all the way to in 2075, 95% of new cars sold are autonomous. And in solid colored lines of plotted different rates of hardware energy efficiency doubling. So the green curve is our current rate of doubling, which is every 2.8 years efficiency is doubling. And the other uh, lines are uh, faster rates of hardware energy efficiency increase. We can redo this with different adoption rate curves. So for example, an aggressive adoption scenario, we're now instead of taking all the way till 2075 for 95% of new cars sold being autonomous, now we're gonna say, and by the time we get to 2050, we've reached 95% of the market share for autonomous vehicles. And as you can see that if uh, we have more aggressive adoption, that means there's more AVs on the road, we get more emissions, which is expected. 
And uh, the other thing we can see is that if you look at the blue curves, uh, this is the hardware efficiency doubling rate needed to keep emissions constrained to that of data center emissions in 2050. So what we can say from this kind of analysis is that in a moderate adoption scenario, hardware energy efficiency needs to double at least every 1.4 years, and in an aggressive adoption scenario, every 1.1 years for us to keep uh, emissions constrained to that of data centers. And again, we hope this provides actionable targets for industry to uh, think about as we are designing for this future. This framework also allows us to change the uh, effect of growth rate on the workload. So for example, instead of assuming that workload will double every three years, we can assume slower or faster rates of doubling. So here, for example, the green curve would show uh, a rate of doubling that is uh, doubling every 10 years, so a much slower growth rate. And we can see emissions slow down because we're able to probably keep up with uh, the rate of workload increase through our hardware energy efficiency increases as well. But even in this case, uh, with workload doubling every 10 years, we're still above that of 2018 data estimations. We can also look at how the decarbonization of the entire grid can help. So our current rate of decarbonization is in blue in this figure. And you can look at the red curve, which would be deep decarbonization. This is a pathway that would result in only 1.5 degrees of warming, which is the goal uh, most of the world has set, but we're not on track for it at the moment. Uh, if we do get there, the emissions from AVs will also reduce because the carbon intensity has gone down. So even in that case, we're still at a significant uh, amount of emissions, close to that of 1% of all emissions today. But the takeaway is that this uh, framework can model uh, different rates of workload growth as well as decarbonization as well. All right, so to kind of uh, wrap up, I'll discuss some of the challenges that are unique to AVs and represent some really interesting future directions for research. Uh, for sake of time, I'll focus on two, two of them. So one thing about autonomous vehicles is that they are an extremely safety critical application. So as much as we can, we, we might want to trade off metrics for efficiency, we really can't trade off metrics that compromise safety in any way. So metrics like accuracy, latency, uncertainty quality, <coughs> robustness, uh, we just can't tolerate that for this task because it has to do with human mind. Uh, so that means that a lot of the techniques that are popularly used for making data centers greener uh, just can't be directly transferred here. For example, we can't uh, wait until the sun is shining or the wind is blowing to run our workload so that it's more renewable energy because that's going to affect latency. Or we can't uh, you know, move our workload to a geographic location that is, has more renewable energy because, again, that's going to affect latency and that's going to affect safety. So we really need some research on what algorith algorithmic efficiency improvements can be made that don't compromise the safety metrics that are relevant to being an AV. And for one example that we could be inspired from is <coughs> resource-constrained robot literature, where a lot of that work looks at uh, low power robots because it's a similar magnitude of the energy in the versus the energy in view. But since we're now worried about emissions and there's that similarity again, some of that perhaps can be adapted to this case. For example, some of my previous work um, that was previewed by Professor C uh, showed that sometimes it's advantageous to not spend all your compute and get the shortest path possible when you're doing motion learning. And instead, sometimes it's better to not think too hard, don't spend as much energy in computing, and accept a longer path. And when you look at total energy of your path, computing plus actuation energy, it can actually end up being lower. And that means that's a one-to-one -to, -one to emissions, that you might be able to reduce emissions through techniques like this that don't trade off a safety metric, but perhaps trade off something like trip duration or the length of your trip. We also want to encourage industry to really use this framework with their proprietary internal numbers and evaluate the footprint of autonomy of their current AV stacks and release that, that, that information so that we get kind of a temperature reading on where we're at today with uh, the AV industry. And the second thing that would be helpful would be at least to release data that can allow the community to do so. So one big metric that would be very helpful is knowing what computer power is in current AV stacks for the level of autonomy that they're currently doing. So to, if you're walking away with, from this talk with just uh, four things, 
Number one would be that emissions from computing onboard AVs certainly have the potential to be significant and may even rival that of all data centers today. The second takeaway is that business as usual trends in decarbonization, hardware energy efficiency increase, workload size increase, probably are not gonna be enough to constrain emissions to that of all data centers today, which requires us to uh, think a little bit in the industry on how we wanna design for it. The third takeaway is that uh, modeling this all probabilistically enabled us to get distributions of emissions that really incorporate all the uncertainty we have in each of these variables directly to make the conclusions um, more representative of what we are certain about and what we're uncertain about. And finally, we really encourage industry to account for that autonomy footprint and release that information on emissions so that we can make sure that as an industry and as a field, we're contributing more to the solution than to the problem.